Welcome to episode 253 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak encouragement into the hearts of educators and get you informed and energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm talking with Daphne Williams Gomez of The Teacher Career Coach about how to determine if teaching is still the right career for you. Visit truthforteachers.com to get a transcript of this podcast episode and links to all the resources that Daphne and I talk about. This episode is sponsored by Like a Sponge. It's a podcast about how children learn from the nonprofit Great Schools, and it's normally geared toward parents. But this year, they delved into a question totally relevant for teachers. How can we transform the 200-year-old institution known as the American High School to make it more equitable, student-centered, and humane? In each episode of Like a Sponge, we hear stories from educators who reinvented their practices and policies to solve for disengaged students, generational trauma, and a legacy of racism. It's all part of transforminghighschool.org, a bilingual collection of multimedia content. You can find Like a Sponge anywhere that you listen to podcasts. So I'm talking today with Daphne Williams Gomez of The Teacher Career Coach. Daphne is a former teacher who successfully transitioned to the field of ed tech in 2017. And since that time, she received so many questions from fellow educators about how she landed her job that she began creating resources to help others do what she does. Today, the Teacher Career Coach has my highest recommendation as the resource for teachers considering a different career path. I've gotten to know Daphne really well over the past couple of years, and I consider her not only a friend, but also my peer in this work. If you want to stay in teaching and make it a sustainable career, you've got my 40-hour teacher workweek program. If you know in your heart that it's time to leave, you've got Daphne and her teacher career coach program. So we really recommend these two programs sort of side by side so that there's some sort of way to support basically any teacher, whether you decide to stay or go. Daphne's course offers resume supports and templates, connections to companies that hire former educators, tips for translating your teaching experience into corporate speak, and more. If you are just curious about options or you're on the fence, start with the free quiz to identify careers that might be a good fit. Just go to teachercareercoach.com forward slash truth for teachers, or you can click the link in the show notes. You'll find special free resources that Daphne designed just for Truth For Teachers listeners. So it's teachercareercoach.com forward slash truth for teachers. Listen in now on my conversation with Daphne in which she shares trends that she's noticing, as well as questions that you can ask yourself to make the very personal decision about whether teaching is still what you want to do. So Daphne, the last time I had you on the show, we talked in February, 2020. And our topic was about how and when to make an exit from teaching. And then the pandemic hit the following month and the economy crashed and everyone was getting laid off. And we were both like, um, no one's leaving teaching. Who would quit a stable job that lets them safely teach from home? Is this episode even going to be relevant? And then that's a conversation we're having on Voxer. And then not even a week later, when we were doing, when everyone was doing emergency remote learning, we both knew Yes, this episode is going to be relevant because as it turns out, pandemic teaching is way more stressful than even normal teaching. And the pandemic is going on for way longer than we all thought in the beginning. And yes, a lot of folks are unfortunately going to need to resign over this. So let's talk about what's changed in the realm of teachers leaving the profession over the past two years since you were last on the show. What have you been observing and what are you observing now? So things, as I know that you have talked about on your podcast, also have started to get progressively worse for teachers when it comes to unrealistic work expectations of just, you know, pretending that everything's normal and getting back to the normal workflow or, you know, quote unquote, catching up from anything that was lost. There's staff shortages. Um, Children's are, the students are really struggling with classroom management just from being put through a lot of stress over the last few years. And that is on you know, that's a burden for teachers as well. And then there's a lot more political things that are going on inside different states that are impacting teachers and their happiness in the profession. So teachers started to leave during the pandemic as things were progressively getting worse. And I think a lot of people started to see examples of 
teaching no longer being, you know, this um, forever career. They started to see more examples of what a nonlinear career path looked like outside of education. And then they started to realize that with all these stressors and all these examples of it being possible, it could potentially be a uh, um, exit plan for them as well. So all the factors that I talked about with the stress that you were seeing outside of the classroom, um, I think that a lot of teachers started to face the same existential crisis that everyone is feeling in the last two years. Just this mm-hmm. low level amount of stress that people are feeling from the pandemic is making everyone really question, am I living my life the way that I want to live my life? And that isn't just your job. It's how, you know, you spend your hours off of your job, but it is a lot of what teachers are really struggling with right now. So I think it's just had a snowball effect on teachers and made more teachers actually open to leaving. But -hmm. the thing is that I've noticed on my end, the majority of people who I do work with who have been leaving, the majority of them actually have been thinking of leaving for a very long time. It still has taken them years to build up the courage to leave. It's not just been pandemic that was pushing them out. It was something that they said every year they were thinking about for the last five or six years. Um, so that that's one of the trends that I'm really starting to see happen. Mm-hmm. So they just didn't think that leaving was a possibility. And then now this is sort of like push them in that direction. Yeah, I think that a lot of teachers... As when I left back in 2017, there were not any examples that I had in my own personal life of any teachers who had left the classroom. I left and I was, I had no idea what other jobs were out there for me. And so it was very scary. I thought I was going to have to reinvent myself. I thought I was going to have to take this major pay cut. But as more people are starting to leave, more people are seeing examples of where other people are going. And they're actually able to check in with someone that they worked with last year and say, okay, you're a project manager now. Is it worse? How's your pay? How's your work-life balance? And all of these different examples of people who actually left are starting to reinforce, okay, it is something that I could potentially do too. And it's starting to help people build confidence that if they were really on the fence of leaving, there are opportunities for them as well. Yeah, it really helps to be able to see examples and people who are sharing their stories and other folks who have done it. And I also think here that it's important to mention that, um, you know, there are also examples of teachers who are happy and who are thriving. um, And schools are not awful everywhere. And often the unhappiest voices are the loudest. Those are the ones that social media algorithms often prioritize. So if you're just scrolling through Twitter, for example, you're going to think like the whole world is ending and schools are just the worst place on earth um, and everybody's quitting. But you and I have both observed that some teachers feel like the profession has been painted in such a negative light that, you know, they feel like maybe they're missing out on something. Maybe they're like, are they foolish for staying? Maybe there's no future in education and they're kind of being pushed out and I know, Daphne, you and I both have sort of like a bird's eye view of the field right now as outsiders, as people who are not in the classroom. And I know you share my belief that there are teachers thriving right now and that there are schools that have really rebounded well this past school year. So I want to say right up front, we don't want anyone to give up on the profession because their school or district has low morale and just assume that it's like that for everyone. If you are a person who loves teaching, wants to stay in teaching, but your school is not a good fit. I really do encourage teachers. Like, I mean, there's openings practically everywhere right now. Find a school that's a good fit for you because I've just heard from so many teachers who love the principal, love their coworkers, and they found ways to make teaching work. Maybe it just wasn't their current grade level or subject area or school. So is that what you're finding too, as you're talking to teachers? Yeah, that's been my first piece of advice for anyone who is struggling with weighing the pros and cons of leaving the classroom is to evaluate a change in environment or a change in your pedagogy or just changes that you could potentially make. And especially what I heard from you say um, that stood out was those teachers who feel silly that they still kind of love this career. Mm. That is what you should lean into. If you Mm -hmm. know in your heart that you absolutely love this career, Start to evaluate if there are smaller changes that you can make 
the people who I am working with are the ones that have felt like they've hated the career for years. Um, there's there's that thin line of people who, you know, still love the career but know that they have to leave. It's going to be a very personal decision, but always thinking about if you've never changed school districts, but you can really pinpoint that it's your admin who's making you feel low. It's your admin who's not supporting you, or it's the parents at this particular school that have just always constantly kind of been doing things that are additional stress that you don't think would happen in a neighboring district. I would evaluate that because that is a much easier option than a career change. The career change itself is never going to be the easiest option. Mm -hmm. I have teachers who are close friends of mine who are in districts that you would assume would be, you know, in their opinion, awful, just completely political or completely polar opposite, like political beliefs is the demographic of where they live during the pandemic. And they said that it has been just a very pleasant experience working in that school, even though they're living in an area that they don't necessarily feel like they agree with all the politics of what the parents or the staff you know, surrounding them agree with. They've been completely supported when it came to um, how they felt like safety wise within their school. They've been completely supported when it came from um, overwhelm. They were removing PDs from the calendar to give additional time for teachers to plan during distance learning. Um, They just felt truly supported and, you know, they were making all the teachers feel really appreciated and heard when they were voicing those concerns she, one of the people that I talked to specifically said, you know, this hasn't been easy. This has been challenging for anyone. There's not going to be a school that you're going to find in the last few years that's going to say everything's been perfect and it's been easy. But there are schools where people feel supported and they are a team and people are happy. Um, There are also teachers who are unhappy but are staying because they are determined to be using this opportunity to take on those leadership vacancies and start to shake things up from the inside as well. So you just have to really evaluate what your long-term goal is, your level of burnout, what your passion is, um, and do what's right for you. It's not going to be as easy as just seeing you know, an Instagram post of someone saying, I love teaching and I'm now this you are a completely different person with a completely different situation. And I would just really evaluate how you are feeling. Mm -hmm. What are you observing with the job market right now in terms of various options that are open to teachers? Oh, yeah. So when I left the classroom, I landed this job that everyone was saying was like a unicorn job because it was a remote position back in 2017. That was very rare. But now these are far more common. So teachers who are living all across the United States, depending on um, if they're near large areas or if they're in more rural areas, they're still able to actually land tech positions that are remote. It's far more common. Um, The top jobs that I am finding teachers successful landing in is pretty similar to what it was three years ago. It's a lot of um, learning and development jobs, training jobs, ed tech jobs. But what I am noticing is ed tech is a lot more competitive right now than it was, you know, two years ago because so many teachers are focused on that being their main strategy. Uh, When you are starting to be in this competitive space, my best piece of advice is to just choose one or two clear paths. Maybe you want to be a customer success manager or an SDR or a project manager and start to really focus on getting the training that you need for those specific paths. And then tweak your resume accordingly to market yourself for those specific positions to help you um, stand out against the competition. Mm -hmm. What I love about what you do in your online course is that you support teachers who are thinking about leaving um, and those who are going through the process of transitioning to their next careers. And you help them think about fields that maybe they hadn't thought about. As you're saying, ed tech is it's a very obvious one. And a lot of people just sort of default to that. What other kinds of fields are you seeing former teachers have success in? And is there anything that you can suggest to listeners that maybe they haven't considered as their next career? Yeah, there are so many roles outside of ed tech that teachers are finding themselves really successful. And I, I, 
I've seen a lot of teachers who are going into nonprofit work, people who are going into like museum education programs. The bigger um, bucket that I see that the majority of the teachers outside of that ed tech bucket go into are learning and development jobs. So that's like training positions, training manager, learning and development manager, um, even like a sales enablement manager. So that's somebody who's in charge of, or the sales enablement trainer, sorry. So that's someone who's in charge of understanding all of the best practices when it comes to the sales team and leading trainings, just specific internal trainings on the sales team. These are larger corporations. If you're in a rural area, you can always look to like warehouses and they'll have an L&D department most likely. Um, but there's also remote possibilities for this as well. Instructional design has always been a huge one that's creating those like e-learning resources. Um, and that happens a lot in the health field and also in construction. So creating like the learning resources and the training materials, but for the healthcare workers or for construction workers. Mm, that's interesting. Wow, I hadn't even thought about that. <laughs> yeah, and what people always struggle with is they're like, well, I'm going to have to be a subject matter expert on something that I don't even know. And what they, they're really downplaying their um, abilities as a teacher. If I was given something as a trainer, which is something that I've done in the past after I left teaching, that was outside of my realm of understanding. So I was in charge of doing these like trainings on coding, which I was not a coder. But they gave me enough time to understand what I needed to know. They gave me enough resources to meet with these subject matter experts. And it was 45 minutes that I repeated 10 or 15 different times instead of what we do as teachers, which is, you know, 15 little mini lessons every single day on a totally new subject. And that's right. where we start to downplay our abilities. But if you were given one thing that you needed to get really good at for a month, you would be able to do it. Mm -hmm. I know on your podcast, you interview a lot of teachers who have changed careers. Can you give some examples of some of the different um, fields that they've gone into and some of the different types of jobs? Oh, yeah. So um, on the Teacher Career Coach podcast, we've done some in at tech sales, some project managers. I have an upcoming one with an editor. Um, I just did one that was a former teacher who went into marketing and has built her way up to be, you know, almost a director level in the marketing world outside of the classroom. Um, even a former teacher who is a real estate agent, former teachers who are former to third grade teachers who turned into software engineers, just a wide variety of positions so that everybody has exposure to be able to hear someone really talk about what that day-to-day -day looked like and how their unique skills from the classroom actually translated into these fields. I highly recommend uh, anyone listen to, to anyone who is interested in this, listen to Daphne's Teacher Career Coach podcast so you can hear these stories and Daphne talks to them about um, what their daily life is like, how did they prepare for the job, how they get the job. So that's a great resource if you want to hear more. I want to talk to the teachers who are listening to all of this and thinking, I do want to change careers because I don't think I can keep this up until retirement. However, I'm waiting for a job opportunity that is just going to light me on fire, that I'm going to be so excited about and feel like it's just this amazing opportunity and the type of work and the salary and the schedule, it's just me. It's just like a perfect fit and I can't possibly say no. And it doesn't seem like that job is out there. I'm hearing Daphne list off all these possible career choices and I don't love any of them. None of that really resonates with me. So if that's you, I wanna posit a theory here and a mentality that I'm starting to see more and more. And it's this, maybe you don't have to love your job. Maybe your job is something that you do so that you can love the rest of your life. Maybe you just want something that you don't mind, that you don't dread, certainly not someplace that makes you miserable, um, but some, somewhere where you can go and maybe you're just answering phones all day. It's just okay. But then you can leave at 4 p.m. and you can go home and you can have six full hours before bed, which you can then fill with activities and hobbies that you love, spend time with people you love volunteer in ways that matter to you, but that you're too drained from teaching to do right now. Maybe your job is something that you do 40 hours a week solely to have the money that's necessary to enjoy the other 128 hours a week. 
So I just want to throw that out there because I think it might be helpful for teachers to think about because most of us have gone into education because we felt a passion for it. We had a calling. We saw a higher purpose to it. And now when it's time to look for a second career, you're probably going to be looking for things that give you that same passion. And maybe for some of you, your passion now is not going to be your job anymore. Maybe your passion will become your art. Like I have discovered now mine is. Like I've discovered all new passions now. Um, Maybe it's spending time with your best friend. Maybe it's spending time with your grandkids. Maybe it's baking. Maybe you need a job that doesn't light you on fire with excitement, but that allows you to have the time and energy in the evenings to come home and experiment in the kitchen and pursue that hobby of baking. So I'm just putting that out there and sort of interrogating this belief that you should only do work that you're really passionate about and you have to find the perfect fit job. I don't think it's realistic. And historically speaking, it's a really privileged position because most people don't have that luxury. And it's not necessary in order to live a good life. Maybe instead you find work that is pleasant, satisfying, not overly demanding, someplace with a good working environment, supportive boss, fun colleagues, where you don't mind spending time. But maybe the work itself is not the thing that lights you up most in your life. And I wonder what would happen if we look toward that as the goal, to go to a job like that and do good work, and then go home and use the money from that job to free you up to enjoy the rest of your time. What are your thoughts on that, Daphne? Uh, I really agree. And I think that word passion is really important to think about because teaching was your passion. You probably have thought about it since you were a child. And so you have this really big expectation to replace a job that was supposed to be your passion with something that's, you know, even more impressive. And when you think about passions, you know, this like art and baking, like you're talking about for hobbies, I see something that happens with a lot of teachers is the first thing that they reach out to me and they say is, well, my passion is social emotional learning. Um, so I only want to work for someone where I get to do social emotional learning training. And that is a great goal if you are 100% firm on that goal. Or I love baking so much that now I want baking to be my full time career, but it has to make me this much money. And how do I make that happen? Like they have this very clear I love being outdoors. So I want my job to be an outdoor job that's also six figures and, you know, a unicorn job just filled with all their passions. If it was mine, it would be like, you know, non-alcoholic tiki drinks at a, (laughs) you know, plant store where I just met a lot of really nice people and maybe we sold crystals, but they weren't too expensive, but they were still like (laughs) nice crystals. And I'm not trying to put down any people who have very clear ideas of what they want. Like that social emotional learning training position, that does exist. It's just going to take a lot longer to find that specific job. It might take years as opposed to people who are on a time constraint and only months. But I think where a lot of this comes from are people on social media or selling types of programs and how they are marketing things to us. It makes us feel less than if we don't have impressive job titles. Mm. There are people who are, you know, making money off of these get rich overnight or it's not success unless it's, you know, working remote on a sandy beach type of programs. And that makes a lot of people feeling less than if they are sitting at an office job that actually all of their neighbors have very similar jobs. It's paying their bills. It may be a pay increase from teaching, but for some reason it's a disappointment for them to, accept themselves in that reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's been, you know, there's been a lot of entrepreneurial gurus who promote, you know, you know, this mentality that you're, you're basically a sucker if you're working for somebody else, and you should be working for yourself. And, you know, you shouldn't be doing a nine to five, but that's not for everybody. Everybody's needs are different. And I also I'm thinking about, as you were talking, I'm thinking about also, sort of the the pressure when you leave one career to go to another, the pressure that you feel to be leveling up in our culture, you know, to be moving on to something better. And if you're a degreed professional who went to college, possibly even got a master's degree in education, and then you leave and go do something else to say, oh, I'm working in this store and I'm selling crystals and plants. 
I think we worry in the back of our minds, like, are people going to judge me? Am I, is this not as prestigious as teaching? You know, people at, at the very least respect the fact that teaching is a difficult job. It's a noble job. It's an important job. And so to go from something like that to selling plants can feel like, are, you know, am I a disappointment? Am I not living up to people's expectations? And I think it's really important to get clear in your mind about what's going to make you happy. Because if you're working 70 hour weeks as a teacher and you could work 40 hour weeks selling plants, like who cares what people think about you not using your degree and you're doing something completely different? Like I think going back to what you said at the beginning, the pandemic has really caused us to reevaluate what we value. And other people's opinions, I think as we get older, feel less and less important. And we're able to tap in more to what's truly going to work for us. So I think that's important to bring out here that like, you know, as you're looking for your next career or considering other careers to make sure that you're going after what's going to work for you, your family, the people that you care about versus trying to live up to this expectation that you're going from teaching into this amazing job that everybody's going to be so wowed by, because ultimately there's so much more at stake in this. I couldn't agree more. And then one thing that I see a lot of teachers doing where they're struggling with this step is one of the um, bigger trends that I'm seeing with ed tech companies that are hiring right now is there are a lot of openings at ed tech companies or software as a service, also known as like SaaS companies that mm-hmm. are hiring um, teachers for either BDR or SDR positions. Those are sales positions that are higher paying entry level positions, but often depending on where you are on the salary schedule, whatever state you're in, higher paying than teaching a lot of teachers are right off the bat super resistant to even like a sales position, just absolutely not. And that's coming with, once I start to ask, well, what is it about that? Let's talk about your personality. Why don't you like that? Like, do you dislike rejection? And they're like, no, I'm great with rejection. I actually, it makes me hungry. Like I can, I can push until I can get my way. And I'm like, oh, that sounds like you're a salesperson, but okay, let's keep <laughs> going with that. And if you continue to prod, it's a lot of what will other people think? Because I Mm. went into teaching not for the money and now everyone's saying I'm leaving because of this or that. So if I take a position that on paper looks like it's a higher paying salary or someone's going to make this inference about me, about who I am as, as a person, I'm just not even going to open that as a career path or even learn about that as a career path because I don't want people to judge me even more after I leave the classroom. Teachers just have such a huge issue with this step, and it's totally understandable because they're not going to have an immediate emotional reaction to the name project manager or UX designer or bookkeeper or implementation specialist. They they know what a teacher looks like. They know what a good teacher looks like. The reason why they went into the classroom is because someone touched them in some way in their past that inspired them to want to do this as a profession. So all of these things are foreign to them and they're not going to have an emotional reaction to it until they start to really get their hands dirty in these roles and really start to try to see what parts of it um, spark joy, you know, for lack of a better term. Many people find themselves backing themselves into this like education corner. So they focus on what parts of teaching they were the most comfortable with. Maybe maybe it's curriculum writing is one example that I have. I've met teachers and I've actually interviewed a former teacher on the podcast who said one of her first roles that she was really pinpointing was curriculum writing. I want to be a curriculum creator, a content creator. And that's great. That can be your full-time you know, role. That That's a great focus. But she realized that as she was opening her mind to other opportunities, something that she wasn't wasn't on her radar at first was becoming a software engineer, just coding and creating. I think she's a front end developer. So she codes and she creates websites. And what we were talking about was what you like is the process of building something. You like to put together a plan. You like to have a vision of what it looks like, and then you like to see it come to life. So it looks different, whether that's still in that back to that education corner or starting to expand beyond the bubble of what you believe you are, you know, um, able to actually pursue outside of the classroom. 
So think about the things that you could do for hours. There are people who have different types of zones of geniuses. There are people who really genuinely like sitting at a desk and organizing files. If they have a really messy desk and just figuring out like, I like putting all these things in these folders and then it makes the most sense to put it like this way. There are jobs that you could do that not, you know, you probably don't want to do it for eight hours on end. But if you find yourself getting lost in even tasks that other people find boring, lean into what it is that you actually can find yourself, you know, doing for hours, but without feeling like you're in this drudge or um, dreaded zone that you don't like to do. So these are a lot of good minds, mindset shifts then. So we're shifting out of like having this very narrow idea of what it is you like to do, um, of thinking of leaving teaching as being a failure. That's something that you and I have talked about before, about how there's a stigma even just around the idea of quitting. You feel bad about it. You feel guilty about abandoning, quote unquote, your students, your colleagues, your school. Um, you know, there's there's a whole sense of like guilt around that. There's the pressure to find an even better job, an impressive job, you know, a job that's clearly a step up that everyone's going to be excited about. Um, And I think thinking more broadly here about what your skills are, what you love, and what's going to fit into your lifestyle is so important because what I'm hearing you say over and over is that what's working for teachers who leave is often not what they had anticipated. It's something sort of out of the box. And I know that that's one of the things that you do in your online course is that you help them um, find another job that meets a lot of the same needs that teaching does for them. You know, find out what's most fulfilling and translate that into another career. So, you know, maybe someone listening to this was like, I love this idea of like not having to find a job I'm passionate about, to find a job that meets my salary and lifestyle requirements, do the job and go home and enjoy my life. Like that could be a freeing thing. Um, for someone else, they may think, well, that's depressing. I love, you know, or, or I, I love the idea of teaching. I, I've gotten bogged down in it. I can't do it anymore. But, you know, I loved that. And I wanted to find another job that I'm passionate about. And I don't like the idea of just finding a job. And I think what you're saying here is that teachers can likely find another job that they're excited about. It just may not be exactly what they're envisioning. And it's more important rather than thinking about a specific job title or even a specific field to think about what are the things they want to be doing during the day? Do they want to be organizing? Do they want to be working with people? Do they want to be at home remote? Do they want to be leading a team? Do they want to work independently? Um, Do they want to be online? Do they want to do stuff offline? And that sort of thing. Is, Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, I think leaning into when you're the happiest If you're around people, the environments that make you happy, the collaboration styles that make you happy, and the skills that you know are your strengths are going to be things that are continue are going to continue to help you shape what positions are good fits for you. But whatever you first thought of, the very first job you thought of when you said, All right, I'm probably gonna leave teaching. And you know what I'd be interested in is this. The likeliness that that is where you end up after you start going through your soul searching journey is slim because you start to evaluate other careers and you're going to find once you start to get your hands dirty that there's going to be new opportunities that you never had on your radar that are even better fit. Mm -hmm. That makes total sense. What would you say to all the teachers who are thinking, I'm burned out. I feel like it's time to leave or I'm going to need to leave in the next couple of years, but I'm really overwhelmed by all the possible career paths that I could take. And I don't want to make a mistake and pick the wrong thing that ends up being even worse than my current job. And I also don't really have the energy to job hunt when I'm not even sure what I'm looking for. And there's so much out there. I feel like a lot of teachers end up in that space. And so they just stay in teaching by default because the whole thing overwhelms them. What advice would you give to a teacher like that? But this is so personal depending on like what level of burnout because I feel like everyone can say at some point like I am burnt out, but you really don't know what that means (laughs) until you evaluate that person's specifics. But I don't want anyone to think leaving is going to be the easy solution. There are risks that are involved that I think it's really important to continue to put an emphasis on that leaving any career is something that is you know, quote unquote risky. 
I personally weighed the pros and cons with looking at my level of burnout. When I was leaving the classroom, I left, um, a, I was very un, unwell <laughs> is the best word I can describe for that last school year. I was crying on the way to work a lot. Um, I found myself breaking down in the middle of the school day while the students were at recess. And then I would try my hardest to pull it together. And I couldn't figure out why I was crying so much, why I was going to the doctor so much. Um, they just kept saying it was stress-related illnesses. It was probably, I would say, on a scale of one to 10, I was a two. Um, so I was willing to sacrifice that two to even try and find a five because I was so low and so broken that very last year of teaching. So when I look at big, scary changes is, are you risking a like seven in happiness scale for a unknown factor? Or are you so low that there's likely not many things that are potentially going to be worse than the situation or where you feel like you're at right now. While you're looking at those kind of options, start to think, you know, what is the worst that could happen if I do take this risk? I got this strategy from the book, Everything is Figureoutable by Marie Forlo, which I love. Um, I just put out the worst case scenario. You know, I leave teaching. I'm not leaving in the middle of the school year because I wanted to have that plan B of having my... Um, teaching license so that if after a year of taking a break and doing whatever I needed to do, I felt like I wanted to return to the classroom, I would have that option. That's a very personal option for anyone. Um, but that was how I did it in a safe way. But let's say I you know, left the classroom. I went into this next position. I didn't like it. Well, then what? Then I would potentially go to a new school district that would hire me because there is a teaching shortage. Um, even when I was leaving, it was pretty easy to get into the classroom. I don't doubt that you would have, um, if you had left on good terms, you would have a pretty good possibility of getting into a school district. So is it worth the risk? There is definitely something to be said, depending on your level of burnout, about what's called a stepping stone job, one that fills your basic needs and one that you get to leave at the end of the day and you have this like mental space to heal and to grow and to figure out your next steps from there. I've had teachers leave for these stepping stone roles. Um, one that was particularly um, unhappy even in her stepping stone role at a mortgage company. But even there, she took that experience and ended up working as a corporate trainer for mortgage companies. I think it took her about six months or so but they said she was a perfect fit because of her combined experience working in something outside of the classroom and her teaching experience made her a great industry expert for a corporate training position. The real question to really ask yourself is whether or not you would regret not trying. If that is something that you're going to think about and is something that you've thought about year after year after year, even prior to the pandemic, are you always going to question whether or not you gave this your all? And if your gut is telling you to stay, it's okay to listen to that part too. Mm -hmm. Yes. Listen to your gut. Listen to your intuition. I think the, the still small voice deep inside knows what to do. And sometimes we get so busy looking to, uh, toward outside experts to give us advice that sometimes we forget. Like, I think I know in my heart what to do. And now I just need support kind of moving in that direction. I also love what you said about the one to 10 happiness scale and about how if you're at a five, six, seven at your job, you have more to risk. If you're at a two, pretty much anything is going to be better than that. And I think that that's an important point to make as well as the stepping stone piece. I want to really um, emphasize that as well. You know, that maybe you're maybe at an entry level or something just above entry level, but I mean, I know right now that employers are really looking for people with strong work ethics in every field. That's the thing that I hear them complain about more than anything else. And teachers have incredible work ethics. Like we're used to just going above and beyond in every conceivable way <laughs> with our time, spending money out of pocket, um, you know, going above and beyond socio-emotionally to like meet the needs of students and their families. Like that's way beyond what's expected in a typical job. I mean, you mentioned just even like a, you know, at a grocery store or something like that. You could start working, you know, as, as an assistant manager at a grocery store, work your way up, you know, or some sort of entry level job. And I think when they see the skills that you're bringing to the table, there's a lot of opportunities for advancement. So that could be something to think about too, that, you know, 
if you're in a really bad place and you need to just get out, get out with the idea of starting with the stepping stone and moving your way up. Because there's certainly lots of opportunities out there. Do you think that's fair to say? Or am I being too optimistic about how easy it is to move your way up in a company? No, I. there are room... There, there's so much more room for advancement in different companies outside of the classroom. Um, if you're going into smaller companies like startup companies, especially like startup technology companies, not necessarily small mom and pop, my plant store that I'm going to work at, <laughs> but smaller companies that are just getting started, you are going to potentially take on a role that wears many hats. So if you're working at a startup company, that only has five people, but they're continuing to grow, they're going to make you really quickly, maybe the human resources manager, maybe you're going to get the learning and development training positions, maybe you're even learning some marketing, helping them write content. There's opportunities in that um, in that type of company that for you to, with all of the hats that you've done as a teacher, grow and be able to put all of that on a resume, on a portfolio and continue to take that to even the next position or stay within that company. Or at larger companies, what I've seen teachers do is they get into these positions and really quickly they learn the ins and outs of working in a company. They overperform because they Mm -hmm. have high expectations of themselves. (laughs) Um, And they also are natural helpers. That teacher itch doesn't go away. So if you get in a customer Mm -hmm. success position, you know how everything works and new customer success people come in you know, three, four months after you, most likely as a teacher, you're going to say, oh, really quick, I put together this Google Doc, I can walk you through it. Your manager (laughs) is going to see you doing those types of things. And immediately you start to leverage yourself as the potential next manager, the potential next trainer in that position. And that helpfulness, that um, resourcefulness, the, the skills that you bring are not something that companies ignore. Many companies are really excited to take on people that bring in the morals that teachers bring, that bring in the work ethics that teachers bring, but they do have an expectation of um, you will need to learn those types of roles like customer success roles or sales roles, but most likely before they put you in a position of managing the people underneath you. Mm-hmm. So you're coming in and, and, you know, in that stepping stone job, learning that stuff first, and then moving your way up to being a manager. Is usually the most realistic, unless you are working at a school district in an instructional coach position, or you're working in a position where you've already been acting as like a district liaison and just talking to all the superintendents on behalf of teachers, you can leverage that and it can translate into these higher up positions straight from the classroom. Um, but that's just going to vary from company to company, which ones are going to be more open to it. What should a teacher do if they're on the fence or confused and just not really sure what their next step should be? I would say just start listening to other people's stories. Start exploring the feelings that you're having because they're very valid. And I think it's more dangerous to ignore them because that's where resentfulness comes from. Um, I do have a free page for all of your podcast listeners. It's at teachercareercoach.com forward slash truth for teachers. So I have a free career quiz. If you just would like to be um, given the career bucket based on your unique skills or what you like and dislike about your um, profession right now, it'll let you know which uh, which careers teachers find themselves in outside of the classroom that are best aligned with your own personal needs. Uh, with that, I also have a link to the podcast. So if you want to just hear other teachers talk about their stories or some of the podcast episodes that I've done with um, therapists who talk about why teachers um, are you know, struggling so much mentally being in a helping position, how that impacts them. Lots of different topics that we talk about advocating for teachers, um, just continuing to fight, even if you are still inside the classroom for systematic changes. And then also just interviews with all these different former teachers. And then there's also one just about weighing the pros and cons of whether or not you should leave teaching. So once again, you can find all of that at teachercareercoach.com forward slash truth for teachers. And I think just genuinely exploring it with an open mind if you are on the fence. 
Um, if you are leaning towards staying, then I would say just trust your gut on that. But I think it is important to know that there are opportunities for you and not to block yourself just based out of fear or imposter syndrome, because if other people are doing it, you know, it is a possibility for you too. Can you close us out with a takeaway truth, the most important thing that you want every person listening to this to remember? I think it's important for everyone to know, I just talked on it a tiny bit, but that feeling stuck or trapped in a position is often why I think so many people end up resenting it so much. It is okay to have a plan B if teaching doesn't work out for you, especially if you are right now on the fence. I would start to evaluate what your plan B would be even before you need it because it actually may help you find peace in staying. It helps you find that clarity and knowing that you had the options and you chose to stay because you you truly loved the career and not because you were stuck in it. 